World in the Making, A Global History, Volume 2, Since 1300, Chapter 15, Part 2. Lake Texacoco and Tenochtitlan, circa 1500. The Aztecs transformed Tenochtitlan into a formidable capital. By 1500, it was home to some 200,000 people, ranking alongside Nanjing and Paris among the world's most populous cities at the time. At first, the Aztecs developed their city by trading military services and lake products, such as reeds and fish for building materials, including stone, lime, and timber from the surrounding hillsides. Then they formed marriage alliances with regional ethnic groups, such as Colula, and by 1430, initiated imperial expansion. Intermarriage with the Colula, who traced their ancestry to the warrior Toltecs, lent to the lowly Aztecs a new elite catchant. At some point, the Aztecs tied their religious cult, focused on the war god Huitzilopochtli, or hummingbird on the left, to cults dedicated to more widely known deities such as the war water god Tlaloc. A huge multi-layered pyramid faced with carved stone and filled with rubble now referred to by archaeologists as the Tempo Mayor or Great Temple. But called by the Aztecs Cotepec or Serpent Mountain became the centerpiece of Tenochtitlan. At its top, some 20 stories above the valley floor, sat twin temples, one dedicated to Huitzilopochtli, the other to Tlaloc, Cotepec was built to awe and intimidate. In other words, one of one native poet, proud of itself, is the city of Mexico, Tenochtitlan. Here, no one fears to die in war. This is our glory. This is your command. O oh, giver of life, have this in mind, O oh, princes. Who could conquer Tenochtitlan? Who could shake the foundation of heaven? The Aztecs saw themselves as both stagehands and actors in a cosmic drama centered on their great capital city. Enlarging and supplying the capital with Tenochtitlan surrounded by water, subsidence and living space became serious concerns amid imperial expansion. Fortunately for the Aztecs, Lake Texacoco was shallow enough to allow an in ingenious form of land reclam reclamation called Chinapa. The Chinampas were long, narrow terraces built by hand from dredged muds reeds and rocks bordered by interwoven sticks and live and live trees. Chinapa const construction also created canals for canoes support transport, building Chinampas and massive temple pyramids such as Cotepec without metal tools, wheeled vehicles or draft animals required thousands of workers. Their construction, therefore, is a testimony to the Aztecs' power to command labor. Over time, Tenochtitlan's canals accumulated algae, water lilies, and silt. Workers periodically dredged and composted this organic material to fertilize maize and other plantings on the island terraces. Established Chinampan lands were eventually used for building residences, easing urban crowding. By the mid-15th century, the Aztecs countered problems such as chronic flooding and high salt content at the end of the lake with dikes and other public works. Earlier in the 14th century, an adjacent twin city called Tlatiloco had emerged along Tenochtitlan. Tlatiloco was the Aztec marketplace foods Textiles and exotic goods were exchanged. Cocoa beans from the hot lowlands served as currency and products, such as turquoise and quetzal feathers, arrived far from far as far away as New Mexico and Guatemala, respectively.
Though linked by the trade, these distant regions fell well outside the Aztec domain. All products were transported along well-trod footpaths on the backs of human carriers. Only when they arrived on the shores of Lake Texacoco could trade goods be shuttled from place to place in canoes. Talat Loco served as crossroads for all regional trade with long-distance merchants or Pochtica occupying an entire precinct. Aztec imperial expansion began only around 1430, less than a century before the arrival of Europeans. An alliance of Tenochtitlan and the city-states of Texacoco and Tlacopan led to victory against a third Atzcapotzalco. See again, map 15-2. Tensions with Atzcapotzalco Salco extended back to the Aztecs' first arrival in the region. The Aztec used the monumentum of this victory to overtake their allies and lay the foundations of a regional tributary empire. Within a generation, they controlled the entire valley of Mexico, exacting tribute from several million people. The Nanata language helped link state to subjects, although many subjects remained retained local languages. These persistent forms of ethnic identification coupled with staggering tribute demands would eventually help bring about the end of the Aztec rule. Holy Terror, Aztec Rule, Religion and Warfare. A series of six male rulers or Tlatoque, singular Tlatanai, presided over Aztec expansion. When a ruler died, his successor was chosen by a council of elders from among a handful of eligible candidates. Aztec kinship was sacred in that each Tlatino Tanai traced its, his lineage back to the Toltecs. For, his, for this, the incorporation of the Koloa lineage had been essential in keeping with this Toltec le legacy. The Aztec Empire was characterized by three features, three core features, human sacrifice, warfare, and tribute. All were linked to Aztec and broader Mesoamerican no notions of cosmic order, specifically to the human du duty to feed the gods. Aztec human sacrifice. This image dates from just after the Spanish conquest of Mexico. But it was part of the codex about Aztec religious practices and symbols. Here a priest is removing the beating heart of a captive with a flint knife. As an assistant holds his feet, the captive's bloody heart in the form of cactus fruit ascends presumably to the gods. The same icon in seeing the past, an Aztec map of Tenochtitlan, page 539. At the base of the sacrificial pyramid lies an earlier victim, apparently being taken away by a noble Aztec men and women responsible for the handling of the corpse. Like most Mesoamericans, the Aztecs traced not only their own, but all human origins to sacrifice, sacrifices made by deities. In origin stories, male and female gods threw themselves into fires, drew their own blood, and killed and dismembered one another, all for the good of humankind. These sacrifices were considered essential to the process of releasing and renewing the generative powers that drove the cosmos. According to Aztec belief, humans were expected to show gratitude by following the example of their creators in almost daily ritual cycle. Much of the sacred calendar had been inherited from older Mesoamerican cultures, but the Aztecs added many new holidays to celebrate their own special role in cosmic history. The Aztecs' focus on sacrifice also appears to have derived from their sense that secular and spiritual forces were inseparable. Affairs of state were affairs of heaven and vice versa. Tenochtitlan was thought to be the foundation of heaven, its enormous temple pyramids, the center of human divine affairs. Aztec priests and astrologers believe that the universe already in its fifth incarnation after only 3,000 years was unstable and the verge of chaos and collapse. 
Only human intervention in the form of sustained sacrificial ritual could stave off apocalypse. As an antidote, the gods had given give humans the gift of warfare. Human captives, preferably young men, were to be hunted and killed so that the release of their blood and spirits might satisfy the gods. Warrior sacrifice was so important that to the Aztecs that they believed it kept the sun in motion. Devout Aztec subjects also took part in non-lethal cosmic regeneration rituals in the form of personal bloodletting or auto-sacrifice. According to sources, extremities and genitals were bled using thorns and stone blades with public exhibition of suffering as important as blood loss. Blood offerings were absorbed by thin sheets of reed paper, which were burned before an altar. These bloodlettings, like captive sacrifices, emphasize the, fertil the fra frailty of the individual, the pain of life, and indebtedness to gods. Human blood fueled not only the Aztec realm, but, also, but the cosmos. Given these sacrificial obligations, Aztec warfare aimed not at the annihilation, but rather at live capture of enemies. Aztec combat was ideally a stylized and theatrical affair similar to royal jousts in contemporary Eurasia. With specific individuals paired for contest, Aztec warriors were noted for the fury, a trait borrowed from the, their pattern, patron deity. Huitzilopochtli, chronic enemies such as the Tlaxcalans, apparently learned to match the ferocious Aztec style, and some em enemies such as Atomi were eventually incorporated into Aztec rank warrior ranks. Mesoamerican warriors considered death and on the battlefield the highest honor, but live capture was the Aztecs' main goal, and most victims were marched naked and bound to the capital to be sacrificed. Although charged with religious meaning, Aztec warrior sacrifices were also intended to horrify enemies. Visiting dis diplomats were made to watch them. Aztec imperial expansion depended on, in part on religious terror, or the ability to appear chosen by the gods for victory. In addition to sacrificial victims, the Aztecs demanded tribute of conquered peoples in addition to periodic labor drafts for public works. Tribute lists included food, textiles, and craft goods for the empire's largest priestly and warrior classes. Other tribute items were redistributed to favor subjects of lower status to help cement loyalties. Yet other tribute items were purely symbolic. Some new subjects were made to collect filth and, and inedible insects, for example, just to prove their unworthiness as an empire that favored humiliation over co-optation co and promotion of new subjects. The Aztec faced an ever-deepening reservoir of resentment. Daily life under the Aztecs. Aztec society was stratified and Mexica nobles regarded commoners as uncouth. In between were bureaucrats, priests, district chiefs, scribes, merchants, and artisans. Although elites displayed the fruits of their subordinate labors, most Aztec art seems to have been destined not for wealthy people's homes, but for temples, tombs, and religious shrines. Despite heavy emphasis on religious ceremonies, the Aztecs also maintained a civil justice system, quite unlike most of the world's imperial cultures. Aztec nobles sometimes received harsher punishments than commoners for similar misdeeds. Class hierarchy was enforced, reinforced by dress and speech codes, along with many other rulers, rules and rituals. The Tlatelolco, for example, could not be touched or even looked in the face by any but his closest relatives, consorts, and servants. Even ranking nobles were supposed to lie face down on the ground and put 
dirt in their mouth, mouths before him. Nobles guarded their own rank by using a restricted form of speech. Chances for social advancement were limited, but some men gained status on the battlefield. At the base of the social pyramid were peasants and slaves. Some peasants were ethnic Aztecs, but most belonged to city-states and clans that had been conquered after 1430. In either case, peasant lives revolved around producing food and providing overlords with tribute gods, goods, and occasional labor. Slavery usually took the form of crisis-driven self-indenture. It was not an inherited social status. Slavery remained unimportant to the overall Aztec economy. Merchants, particularly the mobile Pochiteca, Responsible for long-distance trade, occupied an unusual position. Although the Pochtica sometimes accumulated great wealth, they remained resident aliens. They had no homeland, but made a good living supplying elites with exotic goods. Nonetheless, there was no evidence of complex credit instruments, industrial-style production, or real estate exchange of the sort associated with early merchant capitalism. In other parts of the world at this time, the Aztec remained tributary. The movement of goods, mostly a reflection of power relations. Merchants, far from influencing politics, remained ethnic outsiders. Thus, both the Aztec economy and social structure reinforced the insularity of Aztec elites. The life of an Aztec woman was difficult, even by early modern standards, along with water transport and other heavy household chores. Maize, grinding, and tortilla making make, became the core responsibilities of most women in the Valley of, the Mexi of Mexico, and indeed throughout Mesoamerica. Without animal or water-driven grain mills, food preparation was an arduous, time-consuming <laughs> task, particularly for the poor. Only noble women enjoyed broad exemption from manual work. Sources suggest that some women assumed minor priestly roles. Others worked as surgeons and herbalists. Midwifery was also a fairly high status. Female occupations, see lives and livelihoods, the Aztec midwife. These were exceptions. Women's lives were mostly hard under Aztec rule. Scholars disagree, however, as to whether male political and religious leaders viewed women's duties as contributions, as complementary or subordinate. Surviving texts do emphasize feminine mastery of the domestic sphere and its social value. However, this emphasis may simply reflect male desire to limit women's actions. Since female reproductive Capacity was high, also highly valued as an aid to the empire's perpetual war effort. Indeed, Aztec society was so militarized that giving birth was referred to as, quote, taking a captive. This comparison reflects the Aztec preoccupation with pleasing their gods. Women were as much soldiers as men in the ongoing war to sustain human life. Women's roles in societies were mostly domestic rather than public, but the home was a sacred space. Caring for it was equivalent to caring for a temple. Sweeping was a ritual, for example, albeit one with hygienic benefits. Hearth tending, maize grinding, spinning, and weaving were also ritualized tasks. Insufficient attention to these daily rituals put families and entire lineages at risk. Aztec children, too, lived a scripted existence, their futures predicted at birth by astrologers. Names were derived from birth dates and served as public badge fate. Sources affirm that Aztec society at all levels emphasized duty and good comportment rather than rights and individual freedoms. Parents were to police their children's behavior and to help mold all youths into youthful, useful citizens. Girls and boys were assigned tasks considered appropriate for their sex well before adolescence. By age 14, children were engaged in adult work. One break 
From the chores was instruction between ages 12 and 15 in singing and playing instruments such as drums and flutes for cyclical religious festivals. Cyclical religious festivals. Sorry about that. Girls married at about age 15 and boys near near 20. A pattern roughly in accordance with most parts of the world at the time. Elder Aztec women served as matchmakers and wedding ceremonies were elaborate multi-day affairs. Some noble women expanded their prestige by retaining numerous wives and siring dozens of children. Lives and Livelihoods the Aztec midwife. The in Aztec culture, childbirth was a sacred and ritualized affair, always life threatening for the for mother and child giving birth and being born were both explicitly compared to the battlefield experience. Aside from potential medical complications, the Aztec considered the timing of a child's birth critical in determining her or his future. This tricky blend of physical and spiritual concerns gave rise to the respected and highly skilled livelihood of midwife. It is not entirely clear how midwives were chosen, but their work was, is well described in early post-conquest records, particularly the illustrated books of Aztec lore and history, collectively known as the Florentine Codex. The following passage, translated directly from 16th century Nahatl, is one such description. Note how the midwife blends physical ta tasks, such as applying herbs and swaddling cloths, with shamanistic cries and speeches. Aztec midwife. This image accompanies description of the Nahatl, the Aztec language of midwife's duties, Written soon after Spanish conquest, Ferenc Biblioteca Medica Lorenziana Miss Med Palette 219F 13132 V Su Concession del Mibat. And the midwife inquired about the fate of the baby who was born. When the pregnant one already became aware of, quote, pains in her womb, when it was said, that her time of death had arrived when she, she wanted to give birth already. They gave, they quickly bathed her, washed her hair with soap, washed her, adorned her well, and then they arranged this. They swept the house where the woman, the little woman was to suffer, where she was to perform her duty to do her work to give birth. If she were a noble woman or wealthy, she had two or three midwives. They remained by her side, awaiting for her word. And when the women became really disturbed internally, they quickly put her in a sweat bath, a kind of sauna. And to hasten the birth of the baby, they gave the pregnant woman cooked ketopaltli. Sorry about that. Literally women medicine herb to drink. And if she suffered much, they gave her a ground a possum tail to drink and then the baby was quickly born the midwife all had already had all that was needed for the baby the little rags with which the baby was received and when the baby had arrived on earth the midwife shouted she gave war cries which meant the woman had fought a good battle had become a brave warrior had taken captive had captured a baby then the midwife spoke to it. If it was a boy, she said to it, quote, You have come out on earth, my youngest one, my boy, my young man. Unquote. If it was a girl, she said to it, quote, My young woman, my youngest one, noble woman, you have suffered, you are exhausted. Unquote. And to either, you have come to arrive on earth where your relatives, your kin, suffer fatigue and exhaustion, where it is hot, where it is cold, and where the wind blows, where there is thirst, hunger, sadness, despair, exhaustion, fatigue, pain. And then the midwife cut the umbilical cord. Source selection from the Florentine Codex in Matthew or Psalm. Questions to consider. One. Why was midwifery so crucial to the Aztecs? 
were the girls, number two, were the girls and boys addressed by the midwife and why? For further information, at ground harvest in time in September, Aztec subjects ate maize, beans, and squash seasoned with salt and ground chili peppers. During other times of the year and outside Chinampa zone, food could be scarce, forcing the poor to consume roasted insect scrubs and lake scum. Certain items, such as frothed cocoa, were reserved for, for elites. Stored maize was used to make tortillas year-round, but two poor harvests in a row, a frequent occurrence in highland Mexico, could reduce rations considerably. In addition to periodic droughts, Aztec subjects coped with frost, plagues of locusts, volcanic eruptions, earthquakes, and floods. This ecological uncertainty restricted warfare to the agricultural off-season. With large domesticated animals and metal tools, agricultural tasks throughout Mesoamerica demanded virtual Armies of field laborers equipped only with fire-hardened digging sticks and obsidian and or flint knives. Animal protein was scarce, especially in urban areas where hunting opportunities were limited and few domestic animals were kept. Still, the people of Tenochtitlan raised turkeys and plump hairless dogs, the prize Zolo breed of today. Even humble beans, when combined with maize, could constitute a comp complete protein, and indigenous grains such as amaranth were also nutritions. nutritious. Famine still occurred, however, and one in the early 1450s led to mass migration out of the Valley of Mexico. Thousands sold themselves into slavery to avoid starvation. The limits of holy terror. <clears throat> As the Aztec Empire Expanded sacrificial debts became a consuming passion among pious elites. Calendars filled with sacrificial rites and warfare was ever, ever more geared towards satisfying a ballooning cosmic debt. By 1500, the Aztec st state had reached its height, and some scholars have argued that it had even begun to decline. Incessant captive wars and tribute demands had reached their limits and old enemies such as the Tlaxcalans and the Tarascans remained belligerent. New conquests were blocked by difficult terrain, declining tributes and resisting locals, resistant locals. With available technologies, there, is, there was no place for the empire to grow and even with complex waterworks in place, agricultural productivity barely kept the people fed. Under the harsh leadership of Mostezuma II, angry Lord the Younger, 1502 to 1520, the future did not look promising. Although there is no evidence to suggest the empire as the Aztec Empire was on the verge of collapse when several hundred boarded sunburned strangers of Spanish descent appeared on Mexico's Gulf Coast shores in 1519. Points of vulnerability abounded. Tributes of sweat, the Inca Empire, 1430 to 1532. Focus, what core feature char characterized Inca life and rule? At about the same time as the Aztec expansion in the southernmost North America, another great empire emerged in the central Andean highlands of South America. There is no evidence of significant contact between them. Like the Aztecs, the Incans, Incas burst out of their highland homeland in the 1430s to conquer numerous neighbors and huge swaths of territory. They demanded tribute in goods and labor along with the allegiance to an imperial religion. Also like the Aztecs, the Incas based their expansion on a centuries-old inheritance of technological, religious, and political traditions. By 1500, the Incas ruled one of the world's most extensive, ecologically varied, and rugged land empires, stretching nearly 3,000 miles along the towering Andean mountain range from the equator to central Chile. Like most empires, ancient and modern extensive holdings proved to be mixed blessing. See map 15.3. From potato farmers 
to empire builders. Thanks to archaeological evidence and early post-conquest narratives, much of is known about the rise and fall of the Incan state, like still like the early Ottoman, Russian, and other contemporary empires, numerous mysteries remain. As in those cases, legends of the formative per period in particular require skeptical analysis. The Inca case is somewhat complicated by the fact that the complex knotted string records or also key k pus which have yet to be deciphered scholars agree that the incas emerged from among a dozen or so regional ethnic groups living in the highlands of south central peru between 1000 and 1400 ce living as potato and maize farmers the incas started out as one of many similar groups of andean mountaineers Throughout the Andes clan, sat, settled in fertile valleys and alongside lakes between 8,500 and 13,000 feet above sea level, though often graced with fertile soils, these highland areas suffered periodic, sorry, I got pages sticking together, periodic frosts and droughts. Despite their location within the tropics, even more than at the, in the Aztec realm, altitude, elevation above sea level, not latitude distance, north or south of the equator was key. Anthropologist, anthropologist John Murrah described Inca land at use as a vertical archipelago, a stair-step system of interdependent environmental islands, king groups occupying with the altitudes best suited to potato and maize farming, established settlements in cold uplands where thousands of llamas and alpacas, the America's only large domestic animals were herded and also in hot lowlands where cotton, peanuts, chilies, and the stimulant cocoa were grown. People, animals, and goods traveled between highland and lowland ecological zones using trails and hanging bridges. Other Andean inha and Andeans inhabited Peru's desert coast where urban civilization was nearly as cold, old as that of ancient Egypt. Andean coast dwellers pr practiced large-scale irrigated agriculture, deep-sea fishing, and long-distance trade. Trading families outfitted large balsa wood rafts with cotton sails and plied the Pacific as far as Guatemala. Inland trade links searched over the Andes and into the Amazon rainforest. Along the way, coast dwelling traders exchanged salt, seashells, beds, and copper hatchets for exotic feathers, gold dust, and pelts. The Incas would exploit all of these regions and their in interconnections, replacing old exchange system and religious shrines with their own. Around 1200 CE, they established a base near Cusco in Peru's highland, not far from the headquarters of the Amazon. And soon after 1400, they began their drive toward the empire. Here's the map. I'll try and get closer to that so you can see the legend. Map 15.3. <clears throat> the Inca Empire 1325 to 1521, starting from their base on Cusco. High in the Andes, the Incas built the most extensive empire in the Americas and the second most populous after that of the Aztecs. They linked it by a road system that rivaled that of the ancient Romans. Some groups, such as the Canaris and the Chachacapoes, resisted Incan domination for many years, and the Mapuche of Chile were never conquered. The Great Apparatus Inca Expansion and Religion Cusco, located on an, in a narrow valley but at a breathtaking altitude of over two miles above sea level, served as the Inca's political base and religious center. 
like the Aztecs, the Incans saw their capital as the hub of the universe. Calling it in the navel of the world, unquote, paths and, and roads ra radiated out in all directions and tied hundreds of subsidiary shrines to the cosmo cosmically ordained center. Compared with the Aztec capital of Tenochtitlan, however, Cusco was modest in size, perhaps home to um, at almost 50,000. So Cusco had the advantage of being stoutly built of hewn stone, whereas most of the Tenochtitlan temples and palaces were dismantled following the Spanish conquest. Cusco's colossal stone foundations still stand. The Incas in the early 15th century began conquering their neighbors. In, the, in time, each emperor or sapa, unique, Inca would seek to add more territory to the realm, called Tuwantinsuyu, or, quote, the four quarters together. The Sapa Inca was thought to be descended from the sun and was thus regarded as the sustainer of all humanity. Devotion to local deities persisted, however, absorbed, absorbed, over time by the Incas in a way reminiscent of the Roman Empire's assimilation of regional deities and shrines. Sorry about that. This religious inclusiveness helped the empire spread quickly, even as the royal cult of the sun was inserted into everyday life in, sim in a similar way. Quechua became the Inca's official language even as local language persisted. Cusco circa 1500. And I'll try and get closer for that. Inca's expansion was so rapid that the empire reached its greatest extent within a mere four generations of its founding. In semi-legendary times, Wiracocha Inca, 1400 to 1438, was said to have led an army to defeat an invading ethnic group called the Chancas near Cusco. According to the royal sagas, this victory spurred Wiracocha to defend his people by, fer by annexing the fertile territories of other neighbors. Defense turned to offense, and thus was primed the engine of Inca expansion. Wirichoka's successor, Pachacuti, Inca Yupanqui, 1438 to 1471, was more ambitious so much so that he's widely regarded as the true founder of the Inca empire. Archaeological evidence dates evidence backs this claim. Pachacuti, literally cataclysm, took over much of what is today Peru, including many coastal oases and the powerful Chimu kingdom. Along the way, Pachacuti perfected the core strategy of Inca warfare, amassing and immobilizing such overwhelming numbers of troops and backup forces that was fighting was often necessary. Thousands of peasants were conscribed, conscripted to bear arms, build war roads, and carry food. Others herded llamas, string, strung bridges, and cut building stone. With each new advance, masonry forts and temples were constructed in the imperial style, leaving an in indelible Inca stamp on the landscape. Even opponents such as the desert-dwelling Chimu capital capitulated in the fort face of the Inca juggernaut just after the Spanish conquest Pacacut. Pachacuti was remembered by female descendants. As Pachacuti, Inca, Inca Yapanqui remained in his city and town of Cusco, seeing that he was lord and that he had sub 
subjugated the towns and provinces. He was very pleased. He had subjugated more and obtained much more importance than any of his ancestors. He saw the great apparatus that he had so that whenever he wanted to, he could subjugate and put under his control anything else he wanted. These remembrances underscore the Sapa Inca's tremendous power. The Pachu Kuti's successors extended conquest southward deep into what are today Chile and Argentina, and also eastward down the slope of the Andes and into the upper Amazon basin. It is from this last region, the quarter of Incas, called Antisuyu, that we derive the word Andes. On the northern frontier, the Incas fought bitterly with Ecuadorian ethnic groups to extend Inca rule to the border of present-day Colombia. See the map 53. Here the imperial conquest, Inca conquest machine met its match. Many native highlanders fought to the death. According to most sources, Inca advances to new territory were couched in the rhetoric of diplomacy. Local headmen were told they they had two options. One, retain power by accepting Inca sovereignty and all the tributary obligations that went with it. Or two, def to defy the Inca and face annihilation. Most headmen were along, went along, particularly once word of the Inca's battlefield prowess spread. Those who did not were either killed in battle or exiled, along with their subject populations to remote corners of the empire. The Incas dominated agricultural peoples and their lands, but they also spread their imperial solar cult. Whatever their motives, like the Aztecs, they define domination in simple terms, tribute payment. Conquered subjects showed submission by rendering portions of their surplus, surplus production and also labor to the emperor. Tribute payment was grudgingly accepted humiliation throughout the Andes, one that many hoped to shake off at the first opportunity. Inca religion is only starting to be understood, as the chapter opening description of child sacrifice suggests spirit and body were deemed inseparable. Despite permanent loss of consciousness, likewise, features in the landscape ranging from springs and peaks to boulders were thought to emit spiritual energy. See Reading the Past, the and an Andean creation story. Even human-made landforms, such as irrigation canals, were described as alive. The sacred hakas received offerings in exchange for good harvest, herd growth, and other bounties. Andeans were also venerated at the ancestral corpses as long as something tangible remained of the deceased. They were not re regarded as entirely dead. It helped that the central Andes dry climates were ideal for mummification. Preservation often required little more than removal of internal organs. It would have been fairly common in Inca times to encounter a neighbor's freeze-dried grandparents hanging from the rafters, still regarded as involved in household affairs. Andeans sometimes carried ancestor mummies to feast and pilgrimages as well. Thus, Inca society included both past and present generations. The Incas hard harnessed these and other core Andean beliefs, yet like the Aztecs, they put a unique stamp on the region they came to dominate. The warfare warlike, the Incas rarely sacrificed captive warriors, a ritual archaeologists now know was practiced among ancient coastal Peruvians. Cannibalism was something the Incas as associated with barbaric forest dwellers. Inca stone architecture, though borrowing from older ones, is still identifiable thanks to the use of the trapezoidal, the flared doors, windows, and niches. Seed World in the Making, page 531. Even so, the Inca's imperial sun cult 
proved far less durable than local religious traditions once the empire fell. And despite the Inca's rhetoric of diplomacy, most Andeans appear to have associated their rule with tyranny. Like the Aztecs, they failed to inspire loyalty in their subjects who saw Inca government as a set of institutions designed to exploit rather than protect the peoples of the empire. Daily life under the Incas. Inca society, like Aztec society, was stratified, with few means of upward mobility along with class graduations tied to occupation. <coughs> Excuse me. The Incas divided society according to sex, age, and ethnic origin. Everyday life thus varied tremendously among the Incas, millions of subjects, although the peasants' majority probably had much in common with farming folk the world over. Seasonal work stinks for the empire were, were a burden for men, whereas women labored to maintain households. Unlike that of the Aztec, the Inca legal system appears to have been harder on commoners than nobles. Exemplar, exemplary elite behavior was expected but not so rigidly enforced at the pinnacle of society was the sapa inca himself the son of the sun unquote he was also believed to be the greatest warrior in the world and everyone who came before him was obliged to bear a symbolic burden such as a load of cloth or large water vessel only the Inca's female companions had intimate contact with him. Although the ideal royal couple, according to Inca mythology, was a sibling pair, in fact, dozens of wives and concubines assured that there would be heirs. Unlike monarchs in Europe and parts of Africa, the Sapa Incas did not practice primogeniture or the automatic inheritance of, the, of an estate or title by the eldest son. Neither did they leave succession to a group of elders, the method preferred by the Aztecs. Violent secession struggles predictably ensued, though barred from the role of Inca themselves, ambitious noble women exercised considerable behind the scenes power over imperial secession. Reading the Past and Andean Creation Story. A small Peruvian town of Huarochiri, located in the high Andes east of Lima, was the largest of a Spanish idolatry investigation at the end of the 16th century. The Spanish conquest of the Incas had little effect on, every, on the everyday life of the Andean peasants and many clung tenaciously to their religious beliefs. Wurochiri, Spanish attempts to replace these beliefs in, with Western Christians once produced written testimonials from village elders in Finot, phonetically rendered Kiwicha, the most commonly spoken language in the Inca Empire, like the Aztecs' codices, the resulting documents aimed at eradicating the beliefs they describe have unwittingly provided modern researchers with a rare window on a lost mental world. The passage here, translated directly from the Kuwicha to English, relates an Andean myth that newly arrived or converted Christians considered a variation on the biblical story of Noah and the Great Flood. In the Christian story, God, angered by wickedness of man, resolves to send a flood to destroy the earth. He spares only Noah, whom he instructs to build an, an ark in which Noah, his family, and a pair of every animal are to be saved from the great flood. In ancient times, this world wanted to come to an end. A llama buck, aware that the ocean was about to overflow, was behaving like somebody who steeps in sadness, even though its owner let it rest in a patch of excellent pasture. It cried and said, in, in, and wouldn't eat. The llama's owner got really angry, and he threw a cob from some maids he had just eaten at the 
he had just eaten at the llama. Eat, dog. This is some fine grass. I'm letting you rest in, unquote. He said then that the llama began speaking like human being, quote, you simpleton, whatever could you be thinking about? Soon in five days, the ocean will overflow its certainty and the whole world will come to an end, unquote. It said the man go got good and scared. What's going to happen to us? Where are we? Where can we go to save ourselves? Unquote. He said the llama replied, let's go to the Via Vilca Cota mountain. There we'll be saved. Take along five days food for yourself. So the man went out from the gr there in a great hurry and himself carried both the llama buck and its load. When they arrived, when they arrived at the Via Vilca Cota mountain, all sorts of animals had already filled up filled it up. Pumas, foxes, guancos, wild relatives of the llama, congers, condors, all kinds of animals in great numbers. As soon as that man had arrived there, the ocean overflowed. They stayed there huddling tightly together. The waters covered all those mountains, and it was only via Vilcacota Mountain, or rather its very peak, that was not covered by water. Water soaked the fox's tail. That's how it turned black. Five days later, the waters descended and they and began to dry up. The drying waters caused the ocean to retreat all the way down again and exterminate all the people. Afterward, that man began to multiply once more. That's the reason there are people to, until today. The scribe who recorded this tale, an Indian converted by Spanish missionaries, then adds this comment. Regarding this story, we Christians believe it refers to the time of the flood, but the they, non-Christian Andeans, believe it was the Vilca Coca, Coda mountain that saved them. Examining evidence. Number one, what do similarities and differences between the Andean and the Judeo-Christian flood stories suggest? Two, what do the differences between them reveal? Just beneath the Inca imperial line were the Cusco-based nobles identifiable by their huge ear spools and finely woven tunics. Rather like their Aztec counterparts, they spoke a dialect of the royal language for, forbidden among commoners. Among these elite class were decorated, decorated generals and her hereditary lords of prominent clans, often drawn from these and slightly no, lower noble ranks, was a class of priests and astrologers who maintained temples and shrines. Many noble women and girls deemed physically perfect, like the sacrificial victim described at the start of this chapter, were also selected for religious seclusion. Seclusions were not, was not always prominent because some of these women were groomed for marriage to the Incas. Still, more noble women, mostly wives and widows, maintained the urban households and country estates of the Incas dead and alive. Next came bureaucrats, military leaders and provincial headmen. Bureaucrats kept track of tribute obligations, communal work schedules, and land appropriations. Following quest conquest, up to two-thirds of productive land was set aside in the name of the ruling Inca and the cult of the sun. Bureaucrats to work on behalf of their new rulers. If negotiations failed, the military was called in for a show of force. Lower-ranking Inca military men, like bureaucrats, faced service at the hostile fringes of empire. They had little beyond the weak hold of local power to look forward to. As a result, in sharp distinction with the Aztecs, death in battle was not regarded as <coughs> excuse me, a glorious sacrifice among Incas. Furthermore, many officers were themselves provincial or in origin and thus had little hope of pro promotion to friendlier districts closer to the imperial core. Here's the Inca mummy.
The Inca had and his routine retinue employed numerous artisans, mostly conquered provincials such as specialists, included architects, record keepers, civil engineers, metal workers, weavers, potters, and many others. Unlike the Aztecs, the Incas did not tolerate free traders, instead choosing to manage the distribution of goods and services as a means of exercising state power. Partly as a result, market-oriented slavery appears not to have existed under the Incas, although some conquered young men and women spared from death or exile worked as personal servants. Most Inca subjects were peasants belonging to kin groups whose lives revolved around agriculture and rotational labor obligations. For them, the rigors of everyday life far outweighed the extra demands of Inca rule. Only in the case of recently conquered groups or those caught in the midst of a regional rebellion or succession conflict was this not true. Even then, subsistence remained the, the average Andean for most pressing concern. Artisans produced remarkable textiles, metalwork, and pottery, but the empire's most visible achievements were in the fields of architecture and civil engineering. The Inca's extensive road systems, irrigation works, and monumental temples were unmatched by any ancient American society. No one else moved or carved such large stones or ruled such a vast area. Linking coast highlands and jungle, the Inca's roads covered nearly 10,000 miles. Many road sections were paved with stones and some were hewn into near vertical mountain sides by hand. Grass weavers spanned gorges with hanging bridges strong enough to sustain trains of pack llamas. The in these engineering marvels enabled the Incas to communicate and move troops and supplies with amazing speed, yet they also served with the important religious function of facilitating pilgrimages and royal possession processions, massive irrigation works, and stone foundations, though highly practical, were similarly charged with religious power. Thus, the Inca infrastructure not only played an important practical role in imperial government, but it also expressed the Inca's belief in the connection between their own rule and the cosmic order. Here's this. The, this is the Inca road. The Incas appropriated Andean metalworking techniques, which were much older and more developed than those of Mesoamerica. Metal forging was as much a religious as an artistic exercise in the Andes, and metals themselves were regarded as semi-divine. Gold was associated with the sun and Inca cosmology, and by exten extension with the Sapa Inca and his solar cult. Silver was associated with the moon, and with several mother goddesses, the Inca queens and princesses, copper and bronze, considered less divine than gold and silver, were put to more practical uses. Another ancient Andean tradition inherited by the Incas was weaving Inca cotton and alpaca fiber. Textiles were of extraordinary quality and cloth became the, the coin of the realm. Following Andean norms of reciprocity, Cooperative regional lords were rewarded by the Incas with gifts of blankets and ponchos, which they could then redistribute among their subjects. Unlike some earlier coastal traditions, Inca design favored geometric forms over representations of humans, animals, or deities. Fiber from the Vicuña, a wild relative of the Lama, was reserved for the Sapa Inca some women became master weavers, but throughout most of the Inca empire, men wove fibers that had been spun into thread by women, a gendered task division later reinforced by the Spanish. With such an emphasis on textiles, it may come as no surprise that Incas maintained a record keeping system using knotted strings, something like an accounting device in its most basic form. 
the Kipu enabled bureaucrats to keep track of tributes, troop movements, ritual cycles, and other important matters like bronze metallurgy. And the Kipu predates the Inca Empire, but it served the empire well. Although its capabilities as a mean of data managed management are a subject of intense debate, the Kipu was sufficiently effective to remain in use for several centuries under Spanish rule, long after alphabetic writing was introduced. Although the Andes women occupied a distinct sphere from that of the men, but not subordinate one, for example, sources suggest that although the majority of the Andean living under the Inca rule were patri patrilineal or male-centered in their secession preferences, power frequently landed in the hands of sisters and daughters of headmen. Inca descendants described a world uh, in which both sexes participated equally in complementary agricultural tasks, and also in the contests against neighboring clans, women exempted from rotational labor duties, handled local exchanges of food and craft goods. Women's fertility was respected, but never equated with warfare as in the Aztec society. Interestingly, the Andean childbirth was almost regarded as non-event non and rarely involved midwives. As in most early modern societies, parents treated Inca children much like a miniature adults and dressed them accordingly. Parents educated children by defining roles and duties early using routine chores deemed appropriate to one's sex and status as the primary means of education. Girls and boys also participated in most work projects. The expectation of all children was not to change society, but to reproduce and maintain it through balanced relations with deities and neighbors. Contact with the Inca himself was an extremely remote possibility for ch for most children living in the empire. A rare exception was the Copacheca sacrificial victims, such as the headman's daughter described at the opening of this chapter. Just as Mays was native to highland mesoamerica and served as the base for urban development the potato was the ing indigenous staple of the central andes a hardy high yield tuber with many varieties of the potato could be roasted stewed or naturally freeze dried and stored for long periods maize could also be stored dry stored dry or toasted but among andeans it was generally reserved for beer making along with maize maize many lowland dwellers subs, subsisted on manioc peanuts beans and chili peppers andeans pastoralism played a critical role in inca expansion domesticated animals included llama paca and guinea pig Llamas, in addition to carrying loads, were sometimes eaten, and alpacas provided warm cloth fiber. Slaughter of domestic animals, including fertilizer producing guinea pigs, usually accompanied ritual occasions such as wet weddings or harvest festivals. The average Andean diet was overwhelmingly vegetarian. Nevertheless, a common co component of Inca trail food was charqui. Turkey, hence jerky, charqui, sorry, bits of dried and salted llama flesh. Llamas and alpacas were never milked like many other peoples. Indians restricted consumption of and even contact with certain animal fluids and body parts. The high Inca heart heartland, though fertile, was prone to droughts and frosts. The warmer coast was susceptible to periodic floods. Um, only by develop, developing food storage techniques and exploiting numerous microenvironments were the Incas and their subjects able to weather such events. Added to these, cyclical catastrophes were volcanic eruptions, earthquakes, mudslides, tsunamis, and plagues of locusts. Still, the overall record suggests that substance under the Incas, thanks to the vertical 
Hidalgo was much less precarious than under the Aztecs. The great apparatus breakdowns. Inca expansion derived from a blend of religious and secular impulses as in Aztec Mexico. Religious demands seem to have grown more and more urgent, possibly even destabilizing the empire by the time the last Sapa Inca. As emperors died, their mummy cults required re extravagant maintenance. The most eminent of mummies, in effect, tied up huge tracts of land. Logically, if vainly successive emperors strove to make their, sure their mummy cults would be provided for in equal or better fashion, each hoped his legacy might outshine that his, of his predecessor, given the extraordinary precedent of, by Pacacuti Inca, some scholars have argued that excessive money ver 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 veneration effectively undermined the Inca empire. Two, as with the Inca Aztecs rapid growth by violent means sowed seeds of discontent. On the eve of the Spanish arrival, both empires appear to have been contracting rather than expanding. With rebellion, the order of the day, the Incas had never done well against lowland forest people, and some such enemies kept up with chronic raiding activities. Highlanders such as the Canaries of Ecuador and the Chacapoyas of northern Peru had lost the Incas dearly at, in their conquest, only just completed in 1525. After more than 30 years, like the tax colons of Mexico, both of these recently conquered groups would ally with Spanish invaders in hopes of establishing their independence once and for all. The Inca state was de demanding of its subjects and enemy frontiers abounded, yet it seems the Inca's worst enemy... I'm sorry. Would allies... Independence for all. The Inca state was demanding for its subject and enemy frontiers abounded. Yet it seems the Inca's worst enemies were ultimately themselves. A nonviolent means of royal secession had never been established. This was good for the empire in that capable rather than simply hereditary rulers could emerge. But bad in that position, the Sapa Inca was always up for grabs in calmer times. Defense against outside challengers would not have been difficult, but the Spanish had the good fortune to arrive in the midst of a civil war between two rivals to the throne, Huasca and Atualapa. Also, Atualapa. By 1532, Atualapa defeated his half-brother only to fall prey, prey to a small number of foreign interlopers. Counterpoint. The peoples of North America's Eastern Woodlands, 1450-1530. Focus. How did Eastern Woodlanders experience differ from life from under the Aztecs and Incas? By 1450, several million people inhabited North America's Eastern Woodlands. Forests provided raw materials for building, well, as well as a habitat for game. Trees also yielded nuts and fruits and served as fertilizer for crops then when burned. The great mound building cultures of the Mississippi Basin had faded by this time, their inhabitants having returned to less urban, more egalitarian ways of life. Villages headed by elected chiefs were typical. See map 15.4. Most of what we know about e native eastern North Americans at this time derives from the count contact era, 1405 to 1750. European documents plus archeological studies, although less is known ab about them than about the Aztecs or Incas, it appears that Eastern Woodlands peoples faced significant changes in politics and everyday life just prior to European arrival. Climate change may have been one of the most important factors spurring conflict and consolidation. Eastern Woodlands people were like the Aztecs in at least one sense. 
Most were maize farmers who engaged in seasonal warfare, followed by sa captive sacrifice. According to archaeological evidence, both maize planting and warrior sacrifice spread into the region of Mesoamerica and around the time of the Toltecs, 800 to 1100 CE. The century prior to European contacts appears to have been marked by rapid population growth, increases warfare, and political reorganization. Multi-settlement alliances or leaks such as the Powhatan Confederacy of Tidewater, Virginia, were relatively new. Some confederacies were formed for temporary defenses purpose, purposes and others were primarily religious. Some villages housed over 2,000 inhabitants and confederacies counted up to 20,000 or more. As in the Andes, clan divisions were common, but population density was were lower. Here's the map for 15.4. Smaller gathering hunting groups occupied more challenging landscapes, yet thanks to their varied diet, they seem to have suffered fewer vitamin and mineral deficiencies than settled maize eaters. Even maize farmers, however, were generally taller than their European or Mesoamerican contemporaries. Throughout the eastern forest, including the Great Lakes region, metallurgy was limited to hammering native copper. Copper was regarded as sacred substance associated with chiefly power. Beads made from polished seashells or wampum were similarly prized. Here's a close-up of the map. Chiefs, usually warriors or shamans, elected by popular agreement, headed most eastern woodlands groups. They retained power, however, only by redistributing goods such as surplus, food, or war. Booty generosity was the hallmark of leadership. Few chieftains were hereditary, and chiefs could be disposed of at any time. Individual Eastern Woodlanders, particularly young men, yearned for independence even as circumstances forced them to cooperate and subordinate their wills to others. If the chief's generosity was con contra centripetal force, egalitarian de desires formed a centrifugal one. Some agricultural peoples, such as the Huron of central Ontario, Canada, had male chiefs or headmen, but were organized matrilineally. This meant that society was built around clans of mothers, daughters, and sister. Matrilineal clans occupied longhouses or wooden multifamily residential buildings. Elder women consulted with chiefs, and all women played a part in urging men to war. Agriculture was a strictly a female preserve among the Huron, closely linked to human fertility. Huron men handled risky activities such as hunting, warfare, and tree felling. Their sphere of influence lay largely outside the village. Men's exploits broad, including adolescent vision quests, conferred status. Among all Eastern Woodlanders, public speaking speech was made as a prize among adult men as marital expertise. Only the most esteemed men participated in councils. Children's lives were difficult among Eastern Woodlanders, keeping in mind that this was true of early modern childhood generally. Due to a multitude of vermin and pathogens, inadequate nutrition, smoky residents, and hazards of war and accident, relatively few children survived to adulthood. Partly for these reasons, Eastern Woodlands cultures discouraged severe discipline for children, instead allowing them much freedom. Playtime ended early, however, as children were schooled before pu puberty in their respective arts and responsibilities. Girls learned to farm and cook, boys to hunt and make war. Soon after puberty, Young people began to, quote, try out 
maids until a suitable batch was found. Though this and the seemingly casual practice of divorce among Eastern woodlanders were considered scandalous by modern European standards, stable monogamy prevailed. Warfare was endemic throughout the eastern woodlands in the summer season when subsistence itself was less of a battle in the form of these wars resembled blood feuds or vengeance cycles. According to European witnesses, wars among the Iroquois, Mexicans, and others were spawned by some long-forgotten crime such as the rape or murder of a clan member as such they were not struggler were not struggles over land but rather male contests intended to prove courage and preserve honor warfare closely resembled hunting in that successful warriors were expected to ambush and capture their equivalents up from the opposite clan these unlucky individuals were then brought to the captor's longhouse for an excruciating ordeal nearly always followed by slaughter and ritual consumption. Female and child captives, by contrast, were adopted as replacements for lost kin. The religious significance of captive sacrifice among the Eastern Woodlanders has been less clearly explained than that of the Aztecs, but it seems to have been tried to substance anxieties. Eastern Woodlands religion varied. But there were commonalities. Beyond the realm of everyday life was a complex spiritual, spiritual world. Matrilineal societies such as the, as the Huron traced their origins to a female spirit whose grandsons invented the essential techniques of civilized life. The sky itself was often more important than the sun or moon in eastern woodlands mythology and climatic events were associated with bird spirits such as the thunderbird like andean peoples many eastern woodlanders believe that their materials things such as boulders islands and personal charms contain life essentials essences or quote souls traders and warriors in particular took time to please spirits and recharge protective amulets with offerings and incantations Periodic feasts were also imbued with spiritual energy on the whole. Religious life was an everyday affair, not an institutionalized one. Instead of priesthoods, liturgies, and temples, most eastern woodlands peoples relied on elders and shamans to maintain traditions and remind, remind juniors of core beliefs. Most eastern Woodlanders did not regard death as a positive transition. They believed that souls lived on indefinitely and migrated to a new home, usually a recognizable ethnic village located in the western distance. Even dog souls migrated, as did with those of wild animals. The problem with this latter existence was that it was unsatisfying. Dead souls were said to be hunt the living, complaining of hunger and other insatiable desires. The Hurons sought to keep their dead ancestors together and send them off well through elaborate burial rituals, but it was understood that ultimately little could be done for them. In conclusion, by the time Europeans entered Caribbean Sea in 1492, the Americas were home to over 60 million people. Throughout the Western Hemisphere, Native American life was vibrant and complex, divided by a language, customs, and sometimes geographical barriers but also linked by religion, trade, and war. Cities, pilgrimage sites, mountain passes, and waterways served as crossroads for the exchange of goods and ideas, often between widely dispersed peoples. Another uniting factor of, was the underlying religious tradition of shamanism. The many resources available in the highland tropics of Mesoamerica and the Andes Mountains promoted settled agriculture urbanization, and eventually empire building. Drawing on the traditions of ancestors, imperial peoples such as Aztecs and Incas built formidable capitals, road systems, and irrigation works. As the Inca Capacocha and Aztec warrior sacrifices suggest, these empires were driven to expand at least as much as by religious beliefs as by material desires. In part, 
a result of religious demands, both empires were in crisis by the first decades on the 16th century when Europeans possessing steel-edged weapons, firearms, and other technological advantages first encountered them. Other native peoples, such as North America's Eastern Woodlanders, built chieftains and confederacies rather than empires, and to some degree, these less looser structures would prove more resilient in the face of European invasion. Here's the review and key terms, important dates that you should know. And here's the chapter overview questions. This will be the end of chapter 15. Thank you.